Welcome to the webinar. Today's presenter is Jamie Cloud from the Cloud Institute. In K through 12 Education for Sustainability, we document, map, and iterate our curricula. Our units and courses are living documents that change over time with new knowledge and applied insights. There are many reasons why we do that, much of which is applicable at higher education. This webinar will be a practical session designed to explore with faculty the ways in which we can embed the attributes of education for sustainability into our curriculum and courses and our teaching. We will draw from the Educating for a Sustainable Future, Benchmarks for Individual and Social Learning document, and the Cloud Institute's Education for Sustainability, Enduring Understandings, Standards, Performance Indicators. These are the references for the essential elements of education for sustainability. Jamie will discuss the brain science behind the kind of reappraisal and reframing required to learn for a sustainable future. And she will demonstrate with participants how to distinguish between education about unsustainability, education about sustainability, and education for a sustainable future. Jamie is a thought leader in the field of education for sustainability. She has co-authored the Cloud Institute's Education for Sustainability EFS framework and several peer-reviewed journal chapters and articles on sustainability and the significance of education for sustainability. Jamie works extensively with educators, administrators, and school boards across the nation. She designs and facilitates professional development programs and directs the collaborative development of numerous instructional units and courses for K through 12 and higher education designed to teach and learn across disciplines through the lens of sustainability. In addition to her commitment to furthering the mission of the Cloud Institute, Jamie owns Miracle Springs Farm in Gallatin, New York, where her team is making goat cheese and cultivating regenerative farming practices. She also serves as an advisor, board member, or committee member to several organizations with related goals and interests. With that, I would like to turn the proceedings over to Jamie Cloud. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. It's Jamie Cloud. Um, I wanted to start with um, talking a little bit about what we mean by curriculum. Um, so today, these are the things that I wanted to focus in on. Familiar, familiarizing you with education for sustainability the way we see it. Um, defining uh, curriculum and distinguishing it from instruction and show you how we use backwards design to create EFS curricula and um, show you how to develop assessments and think about assessing for, um, for sustainability education. Um, let's see here. One of the things that we realized early on in this work is that people don't have a shared understanding of what the heck curriculum is. So um, if you look at the literature, um, particularly K-12, there are several ways that people describe what curriculum is. So very quickly, I'm going to give you a couple of different complementary ways that we can think about it so we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. Um, so what we call the formal curriculum is the one that's on the website where there's a paragraph describing what the course is all about. Um, for K-12, we have academic standards. We also have sustainability education standards, character education standards, um, lots and lots of different formal criteria for what should be uh, taught. Then we have the operating curriculum, which is the actual materials that we use to teach with the courses, units, um, uh, handouts, films, anything like that that we're using. Then there's the taught curriculum and what actually uh, gets taught um, at, at any one day or in any one week. There's the assessed curriculum, which is a very small percentage of all of that. And there's the learned curriculum, which is everything students are learning, including everything that we didn't intend for them to learn. 
Um, and what we're trying to do all the time is close the gap between the formal and the learned curriculum. So that's one way of spinning what we mean when we talk about curriculum. There's another whole different way to think about it, which is I'm borrowing here Robert Fritz's structure from his book, The Path of Least Resistance. And this is a nice little structure to describe, uh, again, what we mean by curriculum and instruction and to uh, distinguish them from one another. Um, in There is a structural tension that's created between this prior knowledge of our students before they walk in the door of our classroom and the learning outcomes that we um, have for them. And so sometimes that gap is huge and sometimes it's not huge enough. So you want just enough structural tension, if you can imagine a rubber band there, so that you have to have movement. Um, and there are two ways, uh, tension seeks resolution, so there are two ways to reduce that tension. Lower the expectations, or as we like to say at the Cloud Institute, stick a nail in it up at the top, and then there's only one way to go. And to do that, in um, we also borrow from Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe's work in understanding by design. So this structure is based on that methodology, which is perfect for educating for sustainability, because in sustainability, we're always talking about designing with the desired future in mind. Uh, so this is quite a congruent methodology. So stages one and two in understanding by design is what we call curriculum. That can include the standards, the content, the skills, the big questions, the little questions, the rationale for teaching that particular course, um, uh, the transfer skills, which are very important to education for sustainability. What do we want students to be able to do independently in a novel context with what we're teaching them? Um, that's what we call curriculum. It's the continuity. It's what we can count on each other for. It's what every student will be able to walk out with. It's our intention. It's the what and the why of the curriculum. So that's one way of spinning it. It's also the evidence of the student learning, so that's student work um, samples and that kind of thing, and the performance criteria, how we're communicating to students what we believe quality is. And that could be done um, in checklists, rubrics, exemplars, any number of ways of describing what it is we want. Um, I do work with higher education and, and corporate sometimes, but what I'm sharing with you today is how we do it in, in pre-K-12 education. Um, stage three is instruction. So that's the creativity, the autonomy. Every professor, every teacher has magic and has a different way of delivering the curriculum. Um, and so we focus in on the how when it comes to instruction. How are we delivering that curriculum to our students? There's a lot more, the, the instruction is a lot more dynamic because it depends on the students in the room and, and what you need to do to deliver the curriculum. But hopefully over time, there's some continuity uh, in the curriculum itself. So hopefully that's useful in describing, you know, so we can be on the same page with what we mean by curriculum. Um, so I wanted to start with that. Um, the next thing I wanted to focus in on is why we document and map the curriculum. Um, and I'm hoping you all have these handouts. Um, they were attached, but um, you can read it here too. What I'd love for you to do is to take a couple of minutes and read through, I think there are 10 compelling reasons for documenting and mapping curriculum. Um, one of the things that I can tell you before you go to, to read it um, is that when people ask me to do an audit of their curriculum in a school system, it is very difficult for me to audit it to see to what extent they're already educating for sustainability um, if I can't actually see anything. And so documenting and mapping that core curriculum is critical for us to be able to see what are students supposed to know and be able to do in this place. Um, that's the first order of business. So, and yet 200 years in the business, hardly anybody ever wrote anything down. People have been teaching for 30 years in a school system. When they leave, they take all their toys with them. And so new teachers are coming in every year 
without anything. They get a key to their room. Um, maybe, uh, maybe they get some old textbooks, but they don't have an actual curriculum that they're teaching with in many, many districts around the country, which probably explains a lot to you all at higher education. So what we're doing, there's a huge movement now to document and map the curriculum um, in our school systems so that we can see where kids are supposed to be headed at different grade levels and at what depth of knowledge um, they're supposed to be learning um, at different grade levels. So take a look very quickly um, at the first set of, of uh, rationales. In order to get people to actually start writing things down and document and map, they need to have a compelling reason to do so. So I usually begin this process by asking people to read through these reasons and circle the ones that they find compelling. Um, so take a, just a couple of minutes to read through um, one through six, and then I'll show you seven through 10. So I'll leave that up there for you, those of you who are still finishing. This is incredibly important. We're all on a need to know basis. And if we're asking people to do something they've never done before, um, it's, it's really important that they have at least one compelling reason. And believe it or not, some people have only one reason on this list. Some people say, oh, they're all very good reasons. Um, in my opinion, all we need is one really good reason because it's very difficult to document and map and keep your curriculum updated uh, so that you can share it with people and so everyone can analyze it and look at all those connections. So uh, if they have a good reason for it, um, then they're more likely to do it. Um, the next thing that I wanted to share is that one of the things that's critically important, and I'm just going to show you that this is in the document. We don't have to go through this very much. What do you do with all that curriculum? Uh, because if you're asking people to do all the hard work of documenting and mapping, then those maps should be alive and well and used in critical conversations over time. So we have many, many reasons why um, ways that we can use the, those documented and mapped curricula. What I want to do is focus in on not only these headlines, but what the administration needs to do in order to create favorable conditions for teachers to be able to keep that curriculum alive and well. And so in this part of the document, and again, you all have these handouts, you can, you can read through them more deeply later. Um, these are the things that administrators need to do um, so that faculty feel uh, that they have what they need in order to do them well. Um, there's a lot of ways this can go wrong. So um, we don't want it to seem like the old binder days where there was no instructional value for the documented uh, curriculum. So that's, that's critically important. Um, so once people know, the administrators know what they need to do and the faculty knows what they need to do, um, we talk about what goes into a curriculum. And this is sideways, so uh, it's not so easy to, to look at. This, these are the one, this is the one pager, and I'm going to show you a, a blank template. This document is useful for understanding all the definitions of the different parts of a curriculum. Um, there are every school system 
and every university will have core things that they're interested in and things that they don't need to track. It all depends on the kinds of reporting that you want to look at. What kinds of analytics do you want to run in terms of what your students are learning in that place? Um, we like to, to document the rationales, those transfer goals, the standards, enduring understandings, which are your big ideas, and then breaking that down into content and skills, how we're assessing, what we're assessing, how we're communicating quality criteria. Um, so this is a definitional page, and then here we have all our definitions, so that'll be useful to you. Um, again, you can look at that over time. Lots and lots of different pieces to curriculum design. Um, and here's what a blank template looks like. I'm going to show you in a few minutes some exemplars of how we, what we call sustainableize the curriculum. But we're, we have to sustainableize into some sort of a, a shared uh, template in school systems. The, the lesson plans can be in any form people want because that's their own private uh, Idaho, but um, it's very, very useful to have a similar set of ingredients so that we can run those analytics. So this document is um, uh, just a blank template. And again, the template is different in every place. It depends on what they want to track. Um, so I think that's probably all I need to, I'm just giving you kind of an overview of what educators are up against in K-12 so that you can see what we're trying to map and the form that it's taking. So I'm going to jump out of that for the moment and go to here. Um, I want to show you the two documents that are uh, that we draw on when we sustainableize the curriculum. Uh, the first document I want to show you, and I'm showing you where to find it here on the Cloud Institute website. You can also find this first one at the Journal for Sustainability Education website at susted.com. But I want to show you the EFS benchmarks. This is a the most recent document that defines the field of education for sustainability uh, pre-K to 20. Um, and you can download them here. I'm only going to show you the cover page. You can, you'll have plenty of time to look at the details. This is the first consensus document that we have um, in the field of education for sustainability um, to share. We knew that people were a lot of folks would like to scale up education for sustainability and the way to do that is to be able to demonstrate the impact of it but to measure the impact of it we have to agree on what the it actually is and so we put a call out through the journal for sustainability education uh, for everyone to send us their essential elements. What is education for sustainability? What has to be included? What are the non-negotiables? And 42 authors uh, sent in their, their data, and it took us four years to put it all together, and now it's ready, and it will hopefully be a useful document to all of you. Um, it includes these basic uh, categories of materials. So at the very core is the thinking, the knowledge, the skills, the applications, the dispositions. It's, it's the paradigm that uh, we believe is core to sustainability and to education for sustainability. Then that way of thinking needs to be developed over time through a set of instructional practices. And there are certain practices that are more favorable than others. Um, lecture is not uh, one of them, and I know we do a lot of lecturing at college and university, um, but this is very much a social learning and a participatory um, transformative kind of field. And so um, uh, the learner-centered instructional methodologies are favored in this area. Um, that those instructional practices are nested inside schools that learn, and that's the colleges, universities, school systems, um, individual schools, working more like ecosystems than like factories. Um, we do need to evolve that, that uh, paradigm of the structure of schooling um, so that uh, schools can become learning organizations and evolve and change over time 
again, with new knowledge and applied insight. Then, of course, there's all of the physical plants and investments you have in college and university, the grounds, the procurement, the food in the cafeteria, the transportation, the energy. There's all the physical aspects. There are plenty of other people who have guidelines for, for those. Um, so we don't spend much time uh, developing that work. We're more interested in the thinking. Um, then it's the relationship out between that, that educational institution and its physical community, um, the role that the schools play in the community as a resource and the, res the role that the community plays as a resource uh, into the schools. Um, so there's a whole section on that. And then, of course, it just keeps going out. Those nested systems uh, go out to the biosphere. So this is a really important document. It does not drill down to the level of performance indicators, but it does give you a very good comprehensive understanding of what education for sustainability actually includes. And if you all um, are working in this area and you have something that's not in here, I would appreciate it if you would send it along because this will also be an iterated document forever as we learn and grow. Um, ourselves. Uh, so that's one, again, one big comprehensive description of what education for sustainability is. Um, I'm going to zoom in on um, the types of, I will just briefly show you on the table of contents, um, some of the things that we're including in in um, these areas of curriculum. There are big ideas, and those are categorized into three big um, subcategories, living on planet Earth and some of the ecological principles and physical laws, uh, making change and taking responsibility for the difference we make. So there are some core principles or big ideas that are part of that. This is the, these are the categories for the skill sets, um, again, primarily thinking skill sets, but then of course there's a whole section on hands-on skills. And then there are a series of core content standards that you can see um, uh, here. And I'm gonna drill down a bit deeper uh, when we get to the Cloud Institute's framework. Um, everyone, you will see everyone's work in this set of uh, benchmarks but no one of us um, owns any part of this. So uh, the way that we always frame it is that if you make, if this makes sense to you, then whichever part you want to work on, any number of us can help you work on that part because all of our work is in here. None of us does all of this, but all of us, does, all of us do some part of this. Um, so I'm going to move back to, um, let's see. Uh, another resource, and this one drills much more deeply down into what exactly are we embedding into our curriculum and, and what are we assessing for. So this is the Cloud Institute set of standards and performance indicators. And what I would do is go to that link and come down to the commencement edition. We've aligned this document to many of the strategic initiatives that school systems are, um, are working on, cultural competency, mindfulness, creativity. Um, they're working on many, many different initiatives. We like to see them all integrated into one very rich set of courses and units. Um, so the Cloud Institute's contribution to the benchmarks was the core content areas, the standards and performance indicators. We've been tracking and doing a grounded theory methodology and a meta-analysis on the literature for many years, since the late 80s, early 90s. And we had identified these core areas. You'll notice in the benchmarks that the one we hadn't, we hadn't made into a standard was the many ways of knowing, the epistemology of thought. The, uh, the scholars that contributed to the benchmarks felt that that was important enough that it required its own standard and core content area, and we agree, and now we need to uh, develop performance indicators for those, um, because it's the performance indicators that you embed into the curriculum, along with the big ideas or enduring understandings. So here are some of the big enduring understandings that we had discovered. Um, again, enduring understandings is a term we use in backwards design. Some You may call them big ideas or principles, but these are critical 
we know they're critical to educating for sustainability and we want them to be the big sticky takeaways that all of our students come out of our units and courses understanding deeply um, and being able to and taking with them no matter where they go they may not remember all the facts but they do remember these big ideas um, so you can again you should you have the link to this to both of these documents um, and I would be curious to know over time if you have any questions about any of these or want to know um, anything more deeply about them, um, I would be happy to, to spend a little bit more time on them. Um, I want to move on to just showing you what I mean by um, each of these standards and their performance indicators. Um, each of these core content areas, all standards, especially at K-12, all academic standards are um, in abs written in abstract language and compound sentences. So they don't really tell you what you're supposed to do and what students are supposed to do. So they need to be unpacked, as we call them, into content and skills and into performance indicators and that indicate that the students are on their way to meeting that standard. Um, and so these are the core nine. Again, the one that's missing here is the epistemology of thought or the many ways of knowing, um, because that is a relatively new um, standard for us uh, to wrap our minds around. And so um, any of you who would like to help me develop performance indicators for that, um, I would be very happy. So I'm just going to show you one page of performance indicators so that you can see what what I mean by that. For each of these core content standards, we drill down into what are kids actually doing? What do they need to know? What do they need to be able to do? And by the way, these are, I say kids, but these are um, not framed at any particular grade level. We do have a K-2 uh, version of this document, but many colleges and universities and corporations are actually using these performance indicators because you can scale them up at any degree of complexity and any depth of knowledge you want to. Um, uh, but these are, one of the things we'd like to do is to be able to get enough exemplars and enough student work at different grade levels and from different disciplines so that we can start calibrating um, uh, that work so that we can start to develop some uh, benchmark moments and where should these do, what does this look like at various uh, grade level bands. Um, but these are the actual sentences that get embedded right into a core curriculum. Now, um, Ira mentioned in the introduction that um, we don't talk about, we don't educate about unsustainability. Um, you do need to mention what's what's wrong with the current reality, why we need to change and enough so that people are motivated to do something differently. But if we're telling people that it's game over and if we overload them with all the bad news of what's unsustainable in our current reality, they tend to shut down. Um, they go into a fear state, which is the term that the brain scientists use, and they want to hide under their beds. We need everybody to stay in the toward state. Um, and that means that we need them to stay open-minded and creative and um, motivated and willing to take action. Um, and so we tell people just enough um, about what they need to know, uh, but not so much that they go into the fear state, which is very, very, and that's K to 12. Uh, you all may need to make different choices at higher ed, but I know I teach a graduate course at the School of Visual Arts in um, Design for Social Innovation, and many of my graduate students come into class and their professors have been telling them it's game over. And I think that's uh, not only irresponsible, but not useful. Um, they, if they think game is over and there's nothing they can do about the situation, then they don't have to do anything because there's nothing they can do. So they get a free pass to do nothing. And that is not what we want. Um, so you notice probably in the Enduring Understandings, the very first one, and that's a system, there's no beginning or end, but the first one on the list is that a healthy and sustainable future is possible. It is something we think is a useful way to organize your thinking because that's the only way that it makes any sense to do anything. 
Um, so these are the kinds of things that get put right into the core curriculum. Now, every discipline, I've never met a discipline we didn't need, and all of these can live somewhere appropriately in any grade level and any discipline, but the faculty members are the ones that decide where and when they're going to live in their curriculum and what would be appropriate, what, which ones of these will help them teach what they want to teach, and how can what they want to teach help us educate for sustainability? Again, there's no beginning or end in that. These are these are uh, interdependent relationships. Um, we don't tend to teach about sustainability as a topic because its highest and best use is as a desired future. Sustainable. How can we uh, increase the possibility that humans and other life will flourish on the earth indefinitely? That's what we mean by sustainable. Uh, thriving over time, contributing to the health of the social and physical systems that we all depend on. Um, and so if that's the goal of education, to help everybody uh, unleash their potential and help them thrive over time, um, then we want education for sustainability to be embedded in everything we're, we're teaching about. So what we definitely want to do is make sure we're not educating for an unsustainable future and we've unintentionally been doing that clearly since that's where we're headed. So um, that's one thing that we wanna always look at critically is what are we doing that's actually sending us in the wrong direction? And um, one of the things I can tell you in K-12 curriculum that comes up all the time is that people are constantly reinforcing the notion that humans always have a negative impact on living systems. It's been true. It is not untrue that we've had a tendency to be destructive uh, in many areas, but it is not our destiny. It's not our fate. It is not uh, inevitable that we have to do that. We can contribute to the regenerative capacity of the living systems that we all depend on, and we want to make sure that children and young people understand that we can play a different kind of role on this planet. And so we need to stop telling them that everything we do is destructive because that just reinforces that same idea. Uh, and there are many, many ways that we educate for unsustainability all the time in K-12. Uh, and we need to stop doing that and that's our job. Uh, and then you all can look at what you're doing and, um, and look critically at the ways you might be unintentionally sending us in the wrong direction. Um, so the, this is just an example, again, of the kinds of things we would embed in existing curriculum. Yes, there are certain units and courses that are all about sustainability, but in general, people already have curriculum. And so what we're trying to do is embed this lens and this way of thinking into everything that we're teaching. And so that's the way we do what we call sustainableize the curriculum. Um, let's see, I think it's time to show you some exemplars. Um, let's see, now I'm going to go over to, go to meeting for a second um, to see if there's anything anybody, Ira, do you want to, before I get to exemplars, um, is there any question that needs to be addressed before I switch gears here and show you some examples of what it looks like? No. Nope. Um, no question, okay. just uh, high praise and requests for the links to the documents which I have provided. Oh, great, excellent. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is show you um, a few different examples of what I'm talking about in sustainability education. So now I've switched over to a curriculum mapping software called Atlas Rubicon. And the way that people are documenting and mapping their curriculum is basically there's two ways that I see people out there doing it. You can map on Google Drive. It's a, it's a decent way to do it if you organize your curriculum in uh, an Excel spreadsheet so you can click on the different grade levels or disciplines. It's one way to do it. The analytics are not particularly robust, but it is easy to share documents and, and work with one another. There's a very robust way to do it and, and another way to do it, which is to use some curriculum mapping software. There are about five or six of them out there. I like this one but there are many other ones out there. Um, 
And what this does, if, if this is my account and I'm working with a lot of different school districts and schools uh, and universities all over the place, so I have a lot of different kinds of things in here. If this was one institution, it would be organized the way that institution wants it organized um, by grade levels, by disciplines, and so forth. So I'm going to begin showing you a mashup in the third grade. Um, there was a district, Morristown in New Jersey, who was unhappy with their anti-bullying curriculum because it was the same thing year after year after year and it stopped working after the second time. So they wanted to uh, marry character education with education for sustainability and somehow embed the anti-bullying content into that more robust uh, way of, of teaching. And so this is what we call a pacing calendar. And so teachers can get a sense of how long each of the different units take, which is kind of a revelation for a lot of people because they almost never get to the end of their curriculum because they're not really thinking in terms of, well, this should take six weeks. I only have so much time. You might have noticed that one of our enduring understandings is tap the power of limits because healthy systems have limits and there's only so much time. And so if you only have so much time, you need to be very thoughtful and critical about how you use it. And so chunking out your year so that you have enough time to do the non-negotiables is a really important part of documenting and mapping. Um, so in this particular case, we have a year's worth of units. It's third grade. I'm gonna zoom into the responsibility unit, which is one of the pillars of character. And I'm gonna show you just a top couple of things and, and what this looks like. So the focus is on responsibility. In stage one, um, you can see the rationale for this unit. In the context of interdependence, everything we do and everything we don't do makes a difference. I'm just gonna stop there for one second because I hear teachers saying all the time, I want my students to know they can make a difference as if it were optional. Um, it is not optional to make a difference. Um, as we say here, everything we do and everything we don't do already makes a difference. So we wanna be intentional about the difference we make, make it, read the feedback, see how close or far we got and keep working on it and keep iterating towards the future we want. Um, so it's important for kids, and these are third graders, they're seven and eight years old. It's important for us all to be intentional about and take responsibility for the difference we make. So that's the big rationale for this unit. Um, the transfer goals, as you can see, they want kids to take responsibility, um, particularly the bystanders, um, which they now call upstanders, um, because they want um, absolute no tolerance for bullying. Um, we want kids to identify ways in which they can take responsibility for themselves and each other and so forth. You can read all of that on your own, take responsibility for their actions um, and set goals for themselves in cooperation with members and of their family and their community. And then these are the EFS standards that, that these teachers decided were critical for this particular unit. So what I'm gonna show you is how, how it works. So when people want to choose either academic standards or sustainability education standards, they click on the standards, which, are very, um, which is a very elegant way to do it. School systems have a lot of things they're supposed to do. And so this is a laundry list of different standards for different states and different regions. Um, we won't go into all of that, but our standards and indicators live in this system in the back end. So if somebody wants to educate for sustainability, they can click on our standards, they can click on the grade levels, whether if they're pre-K two or all grades, um, which this one is, and then they can click on the ones that they think are appropriate for this particular unit. And so as you can see, these teachers decided that they wanted kids to learn how to set goals, develop indicators, uh, and begin to measure to the extent to which they're moving toward or away from their goals. Some of you may know that reading the feedback is an incredibly important aspect of educating for sustainability and moving towards sustainability its help. And being able to track and make that feedback visible, whether it's uh, going to 100% renewable energy or waste or whatever it is you're tracking, 
making that feedback visible is makes our little reptilian brains respond to the data and makes us want to keep going. If we can't see it, we don't take responsibility for it. And that's some of the brain science. I would highly recommend that you read an article called Scarf by David Rock, which is in the neural leader. Uh, he's at the Neural Leadership Institute and it describes so many reasons why people have such a difficult time um, with understanding sustainability and taking actions toward it. Um, and if I have time, if somebody asks me a question about it, I can explain more on that. Um, so one of the indicators was the um, uh, setting goals and so forth. The other one is to persevere. Um, kids, some of you may know Carol Dweck's work. She talks about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. K-12 school systems are producing children and young people with the fixed mindset. So they come in saying, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. I'll get the A. I'm out of here. This is not useful for anyone. You're probably getting our students uh, in colleges and universities. That is not what we want. We need curious um, uh, young people who are continuously improving what they're learning and how they're learning. They learn to learn and think about their thinking. Um, and that's harder work. And so we need them to, to, to learn how to persevere and to um, understand that that's just a part of it. When we're making transformative change, when we're making this mid-course correction, it is not going to be instant orange juice. So they are going to have to keep on it forever. I've been working on this since I was 11 years old. I just turned 62. So believe me, perseverance is required. <laughs> So, and then I won't go into all this detail, but you can see here, they've chosen read the feedback and we're all responsible, obviously. And then they've chosen some big ideas. And the essential question is, bullying is wrong and it hurts everybody, what can we do about it? So that's the way the third grade teachers are embedding EFS into a bullying curriculum with character education on the side. So again, all integrated into a rich curriculum in the same amount of time. Um, if there's never going to be more time. This cannot be an add-on. We cannot make sustaining human and other life uh, on planet Earth a, an add-on. That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so now a more predictable one that you might expect to see is an environmental cor uh, studies course. This course is, um, let's see, is that the one I wanted to show you? Um, actually, no, I wanted to show you a different one. Ah, yes, Environmental Science, Earth and People. So this is a 12th grade course, and this is a dean of education who also teaches um, this particular course. He was unhappy with um, the, the depressed nature of his students at the end of each of his courses, and so he wanted to do something about it. And so he chose, he wanted students to take responsibility again to assess the long-term impact of their immediate choices and make better choices, basically. Um, uh, so not just blame them for their bad choices, but help them connect to the results of their actions so that they could make better choices. Um, he chose sustainable economics. You can see here again, he went to our um, standards. He chose sustainable economics. And these are four of the performance indicators um, in that standard. He chose all four. And then um, here are the the kinds of things that he chose to embed right into this course. And I have a wonderful story. Um, uh, he, I, I do get some, some great feedback. And there was one of his students actually converted her grandfather's um, uh, store, got all of his car companies to go solar. Um, after much discussion and um, they were teasing her in the beginning about her interest in the environment and uh, by the end of the conversation all of his shops were converted so this is the power of young people and um, so again he chose create change at the source not the symptom read the feedback the big idea is small choices and resource use have cumulative effects and then what can I do to better manage my use of resources was the essential question so that's a more typical kind of course that I think you would probably imagine. Um, so now I'm gonna blow your minds a little bit and show you some not so typical ones. 
Um, this one is I work with independent schools and public schools and charter schools and home schools and uh, it's quite fun. This one is a college algebra course. Um, the math teachers love the dynamic modeling and um, iterative algebra and there's so many things that the math teachers can do as long as it has to do with math that they're, they're interested. So this one is the modeling and this is again um, 12th grade college algebra um, and this teacher decided that he wanted them he was talking about dynamic equilibrium in a system and if that is the state and he was he was uh, comparing that to social <laughs> equity and saying basically it just makes mathematical sense to have social equity because the system wants to be in dynamic equilibrium and so he chose to do that to talk about social equity through algebra which i just found fascinating there's no one way that this works every teacher every faculty every curriculum designer combines the pieces um, in a different way as long as the pieces are there um, we're happy um, and then it, again the essential question here is can we rebalance the system for optimal potential um, so and how can math help us get there so what does math have to do with social equity and a sustainable future and if any of you have read drawdown um, then you know that uh, mathematicians can be very useful to us um, because we have to do the math, we have to get creative, and we need the social contracts. Um, so this is a math teacher's contribution. And again, he chose, we're all in this together, we're interdependent on one another and on the living systems upon which all life depends. He chose healthy systems have limits and we're all responsible. Those are very popular ones, people love those. Um, now I'm going to show you some another one that you might not think of as uh, a discipline that would be interested in educating for sustainability. And I've just got two more and then I'm going to open it up for, for Q&A. Um, this one is a computer science course and this teacher is teaching cybersecurity and She's interested in logical approaches to problem solving and applied learning. She wants uh, kids to handle abstraction and they're all designing cybersecurity programs. And these are the EFS standards that she chose. So she chose responsible citizenship, the dynamics of systems and change and inventing and affecting the future. And all of that, again, it's not about sustainability as a topic. It is for a sustainable future in the sense that it develops the habits of mind of this way of thinking and then helps students to transfer this way of thinking in anything that they do. That's the key to the transfer goal because it's not enough to know something in one context. You need to be able to transfer it and apply these ideas uh, anywhere that you go. And finally, I'm just going to show you um, one more, I think. And that is how somebody sustainabilized Beowulf and that piece of literature and unpacked it, the piece of literature. And so um, in this case, the there are many ways you can teach Beowulf, but the way that she sustainabilized it is to focus on the character Grendel and the monster that destroying the people and the land and the parallel for the causes of destruction of life and community. And in turn to reach um, uh, to reach high and to look at the epic heroes and how we can come together and create a positive response. So she educates for sustainability by teaching Beowulf. And again, she chose cultural preservation and transformation, dynamics of systems and change, and multiple perspectives as the EFS attributes um, and ways of thinking um, that she thought would help her educate for sustainability and teach Beowulf at the same time. So I think I'm going to come back to you all and um, take some questions. So, uh, so uh, we do have a question from Anton Camerata. How do your EFS standards integrate with the Quality Matters framework? 
Well, the quality matters framework, as I understand it, is about quality instruction. Is that is that the same? Are we talking about the same thing? I'm not. Let me unmute Anton and let him uh, elaborate. Anton, I've unmuted you. Hi, Anton. Yeah, Quality Matters is a framework for ensuring integrity in classes, and um, it has a number of, uh, of, of, of uh, rubrics, um, uh, standards, uh, including um, uh, some, uh, some structures for developing classes that have integrity. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's been incorporated in what you're doing or if that's uh, something that's kind of just out there. Uh, it's something that's out there right now. I'm, I know it a little tiny bit. I have not done any sort of alignment um, or crosswalk with it, but uh, give me a little time and I'll do a crosswalk and I can tell you more specifically. But it sounds like it's completely congruent because good instructional practice, we haven't had to, to actually make up any good instructional practice to educate for sustainability. Anything that makes curriculum or teaching and learning more robust will work whether you're educating for sustainability or unsustainability. Um, so better to apply it to education for sustainability. But but thank you for that. And I will um, look for that in a, in about a month because I have a few other things I have to do before then. And I'll, I'll make an alignment document for it. And I'll look for the places where I see connections. But I would also encourage you to do the same thing. And let me know what you know where you see uh, congruence and alignment. The next comment and question that was posted is from Isabel Rimanakosi. Rimin Sorry about that, Isabel. I do know how to pronounce your last name. Uh, Isabel says, uh, Jamie, something similar to what I pointed out to you as we were preparing. Um, Isabel says, I have seen K through 12 educators better prepared on pedagogy than higher ed professors. Hmm. What has been your experience sharing this more sophisticated approach to documenting and setting learning outcomes with higher ed, particularly in business schools? Yeah. Um, well, um, most professors that I work with, um, they have a syllabus and they have a, a, a readings and they have lectures and they have things like that um, that they teach every year, they don't necessarily know the learner-centered pedagogies. And um, I think what I've experienced is that they are willing, if they know that it's going to work better, they're willing to try it. But in some cases, they have 300 students in their rooms. So it all depends on the structure of the, the way the classes are. If they're smaller class sizes and they can do more um, smaller seminar types of things, that makes it a whole lot easier. Um, but they, um, both, this is new to most of the higher ed folks, just the, the fact that they would share what their syllabus is with other folks so that we can look for interdisciplinary connections. Um, that's radical. Um, but I always say, you know, if you follow a student around for a day and try to make sense out of that day, moving from one course to the other to the other, you will have more empathy for the students and you'll see how it would make much more sense if everywhere they went, things were connected to everywhere else they went. Um, so, but it's, it's, if it's, if it's this different in K-12, I can, you can imagine that it's, it's almost unheard of at higher ed. But again, if it works better and if they're serious about, if the business school wants to educate for sustainability, um, they, they realize that they have to do more sort of learner centered, um, methodologies and, and practical methodologies and applied learning. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. And uh, earlier in the presentation, Ashwani uh, was asking if uh, you can say a bit more about uh, the SCARF article by uh, David Rock. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. So this will explain a lot. So David has, um, through a lot of the research that he's done with brain scientists, um, the brain scientists use the terms the toward state and the away state to describe the two states of mind that we generally are in. Um, and SCARF, the toward state is where everything good happens is the way they describe it. Happiness, learning, insight, creativity, love, everything good happens in the toward state. And the away state is the fear state. And we're supposed, the brain shuts down, the neural pathways literally shut down because we're supposed to be either running or fighting or flighting or as uh, in the women's research, women gather. But either way, they're not creating a new there there's no emergence there's they're not creating anything new um, and motivated to make change they're in a fear state so the things that trigger either the toward or the away state um, show up very nicely in an acronym called scarf so s in scarf is status your status in the tribe determines whether you're in the toward state or the away state if i say something to you that threatens your status in your tribe, you're in the away state. If I if I lift up your status in the tribe, you're gonna stay with me. Um, C is for certainty, because we are hardwired to think of change as a death threat. And right now, um, it's really important for people to realize that not changing is where the real threat is, that we need to change, and that that's going to be a whole lot less threatening than status quo. Um, but these are all things that our brains are hardwired to to react to. And so we need to help each other um, learn both the brain science of learning um, and also particularly sustainability education happens to trigger all of these <laughs> all the time. So it's important that we understand that. So we need to help people um, understand that the safety is in the change. A is for autonomy. We are hardwired to need to exercise our free will. So, and usually when people hear the term sustainability, they immediately think you're gonna tell them what to do. And it's gonna, it's a fear of a loss of autonomy. Um, so um, that doesn't work. R is for relatedness, which we can um, celebrate that we don't, we like to be in the in crowd. We like to be in relation to one another. Nobody wants a timeout. Um, and so if this is what everybody's doing, that's a great way to bring people into the fold. And F is for fairness. Uh, and the tricky thing about fairness is even though we're hardwired to be fair, fairness only applies to us, not to them from our reptilian brain's point of view. So it applies to the tribe. And so we need to help people see that um, the us, the us and them is something we need for identity purposes. But outside of that, uh, us is every living thing on the planet. Um, so that in a nutshell, but somebody marked the, the paper so you can read it for yourself um, uh, if somebody just posted it. So that's great, your brain at work. Very good, Jamie. Uh, this was an extraordinary presentation. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Um, we had high expectations and you did not disappoint. So um, uh, thanks, thanks again. Thanks to all the uh, participants for the good uh, questions and information posted in the chat box. We'll sign off for today. The um, video recording and the links to Jamie's documents will be posted within a few days on the SEC website, which is curriculumforsustainability.org. Again, thanks to Jamie. Look for us again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.